Right now, as of the recording of this video, the average price of retail gasoline is $3.59 a gallon. It's a huge relief from last summer's nightmare when gas prices were more than a dollar higher, near $5 a gallon. But here's the thing. If you look at this from January to now, retail gas prices have been steadily rising. And a recent poll shows that 45% of Americans are either very concerned or extremely concerned about rising gas prices. Today, we're talking about what's happening with gas prices and what we can expect this summer. We'll also talk about why some countries are able to get cheaper gas and why the oil industry in Venezuela collapsed. Also, there's a big myth that the largest producer of crude oil in the world is a country in the Middle East, but that's dead wrong. Believe it or not, the largest producer is the U.S. We'll talk more about what that even means, and I'll also give you a glimpse of who holds the best quality crude oil in the world. The answer might surprise you. In the 1930s, the average gas price per gallon in the States never went beyond 20 cents a gallon. By the 1950s, we hit the 30 cent mark, and it stayed that way for about 20 years. So much for inflation, but then in the 1970s, the Western world, including the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, saw the energy crisis. I'm talking about substantial petroleum shortages and elevated prices. In fact, prices per barrel skyrocketed from three bucks to $12. Pretty much Americans saw gas prices rise from 30 cents a gallon to 80 six cents as many of us can recall. There was a huge global recession in the late 1970s and early 1980s. In the 1970s, unemployment went from 5.1% to 9%. And by 1982, unemployment hit 10.8%. That was the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression. Gas prices shot up to a buck 31 a gallon. For the most part, the 2000s saw a steady rise in gas prices. By the summer of 2019, just before the pandemic, average gas price in the U.S. was around $2.70. The pandemic caused gas prices to take a nosedive, and the national average crashed below $2. But we survived the pandemic, and right now the average price is almost a dollar more than pre-pandemic levels. But here's the thing. Compared to decades ago, modern cars are a lot more fuel efficient. But regardless of how fuel efficient your car is, it doesn't make paying almost four bucks a gallon any less painful. Anyway, analysts forecast the prices will rise steadily this summer due to summertime surge, but it shouldn't peak to last year's crazy high. That's assuming, of course, we don't have a major downturn in a world scene with a situation in Ukraine or another wild car like a hurricane. If you've traveled outside the country, you already know there's a huge price disparity in gas prices, depending on the country. Various factors impact that, of course, but a huge part of it comes down to one thing, taxes. Every country has its unique tax on gas. Some countries tax it highly worth, others don't tax it as much. Here's something that surprises many people. The countries with the biggest crude oil reserves aren't necessarily the world's largest producers of oil and vice versa. Believe it or not, the U.S. is the largest producer of oil. We also consume the most oil in the world, yet we don't have the largest reserve. Here in the U.S., we hold just under 36 billion barrels, if you count condensate reserves separately. Based on our estimated daily consumption rate of 19.11 million barrels per day, 36 billion barrels of oil would last us just over five years. But if you were to include condensate reserves in the count, that estimate is almost double between 68 to 74 billion barrels. Let's put this in context. Russia has about twice the reserve as the U.S., about 80 billion barrels. It's the third largest producer of oil in the world, producing some 9.4 billion barrels, including condensates. The United Arab Emirates, or UAE, hold nearly 50% more in reserves than Russia. I'm talking 111 billion barrels of crude oil in its reserve. On average, it transports 2.7 million barrels of oil every single day. Canada has an even larger reserve of 171 billion barrels, and it's the fourth largest oil producer in the world. If you add the UAE's reserve and Canada's reserve, pretty much that's the amount of reserve that Saudi Arabia has, which is 267 billion barrels. Back in 2021, Saudi Arabia was producing just over 9 million barrels daily. In 2022, it grew to 11.5 million barrels. By 2027, Saudi Arabia hopes to produce 13 million barrels a day. Right now, Saudi Arabia is the second largest oil producer globally. Now, the holder of the world's largest reserve is also one of the most troubled countries in the world. I'm talking about Venezuela. It holds over 300 billion barrels. You'd think that having the world's largest oil reserve means you'd be one of the biggest oil producers. But actually, that's not the case for Venezuela. Last year, the country produced only 600,000 to 700,000 million barrels daily. Reason for this is due to U.S. sanctions, the current economic crisis in Venezuela, and also internal corruption, all of which makes it difficult for Venezuela to export and capitalize on its 
rich reserves. In fact, not only is Venezuela not exporting as much, but worse yet, its own people have experienced fuel shortages multiple times. And in fact, at times the country has had to import oil. But it wasn't always this way. In the 1940s, Venezuela was the third largest producer of crude oil in the world. And by the 1990s and early 2000s, Venezuela was flourishing. But then, the first major oil price slump hit the Venezuelan economy, and it hit hard. Before the country even had a chance to recover, it got hit multiple times by U.S. sanctions, which made things worse. Hugo Chavez became the president of Venezuela in the late 90s, and everything changed. In 2002, Chavez tries to seize control of the oil company Petroleos de Venezuela, or PDVSA. The employees didn't want to go down easy, and they staged a huge strike. To strike back, Chavez fired 19,000 oil workers, and that included a whopping 80% of the country's top engineers. This is one of the biggest factors why the oil situation is so bad in Venezuela. By the way, with the military coup attempt and the chaos, Chavez became convinced that the U.S. was behind the whole plot. So he cut any links Venezuela shared with the U.S., including the oil industry. And he enacted a policy agenda which he called socialism for the 21st century. This turned Venezuela from one of the most prosperous countries in Latin America to a state of humanitarian and geopolitical crisis. Chavez rewrote the Constitution, restricted freedom of the press, nationalized over a thousand private companies, and destroyed the national currency with hyperinflation. By 2014, Venezuela started rationing out gas to its own people. Part of the reason was because it subsidized domestic gas, which was being smuggled to Colombia for higher prices. By 2017, things got so bad that Venezuela, the country with the largest oil reserves in the world, had to start importing gas from other countries. But let's talk about big oil. Did you know that at the beginning of the 20th century that America had five oil giants? Standard Oil of California, Gulf Oil, Texaco, Jersey Standard, and Standard Oil of New York. The first three would later end up becoming Chevron, and the last two would later become Exxon Mobil. At that time, besides the five major American companies, there were the two big oil giants in the world, and both are British. The British Royal Dutch Shell, which today is known as Shell, and the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, which eventually became BP, or British Petroleum. Last year, Joe Biden visited Saudi Arabia trying to convince the prince to produce more oil. Discussions failed, and instead oil prices rose, and the countries that made up OPEC cut their oil production. The Organization for the Petroleum Exporting Countries Plus, or OPEC Plus, is a group of 23 oil exporting countries that meet regularly to decide how much crude oil to sell in the world market. Initially, OPEC was a group of five countries that expanded to 13. It produced 20% of the world's total oil. In 2016, OPEC signed an agreement with 10 other oil producing countries to create what is now called OPEC Plus. Together, the 23 countries are responsible for producing 60% of the world's total oil. OPEC Plus now influences global oil market, balances and oil prices more than ever before. In a way, it's like legalized price fixing. The group is so powerful that multiple reporters have asked, Are you using energy as a weapon? Of course, OPEC Plus denies these allegations. We are not endangering the energy market. We are providing security, stability, to the energy market. Now let's talk about the best crude oil. Crude oil is a fossil fuel and black liquid found in geological formations. It's formed from dead organisms that are buried under intense heat and pressure. Today there are over 160 different crude oils traded in the market. Oils are labeled based on region and chemical makeup, which in turn defines the quality of oil and therefore the market value. First factor is weight. Light oil leads less processing and produces a higher percentage of gasoline and diesel compared to heavy oil. On the other hand, heavy oil evaporates slowly. It contains material that will be used to make heavy products like asphalt and feedstock for plastics and petrochemicals. Oil weight is measured in API gravity units which measure the density of oil. The lighter the oil, the higher the API. Then there's sweetness. The amount of sulfur determines whether it gets labeled as sweet or sour. Sweet crude is a crude oil with very low levels of sulfur, less than 0.5%. Anything above 0.5% is considered sour. Sour oil requires more processing and treating in order to remove the sulfur. That is why sweeter oil holds more market value. And lastly, there's the TAN count. TAN stands for total acid number. Pretty much, this tells you how corrosive the crude oil is. The smaller the TAN number, the less corrosive it is. Normally, lighter oils have a lower TAN than heavier oils. The best oils are the ones that are light, sweet, and less corrosive. In other words, the one with a high API sulfur content, less than 0.5%, and low TAN count. Needless to say, crude oil with these characteristics tend to be more expensive. 
When you consider these key characteristics, we see that some of the best oil is produced right here in the U.S. West Texas Intermediate Oil, or WTI, is typically light and only has a sulfur content of less than 0.24%. There's also Brent oil that comes from the Scottish Brent and Ninian systems located in the North Sea. Brent oil is also light and sweet. Oil from OPEC country tends to include seven different crude oils. Typically, OPEC oil is heavy and sour. Ever wonder how we make gas from oil? The whole process starts with what's called distilling. And oil gets superheated, it becomes a vapor. The vapor then goes through a distillation unit. And as it rises and cools, the vapor turns back into a liquid. Using stacks, the vapor then goes into the distillation unit. It rises and cools. The vapor turned into a liquid. Using stacks of trays, the liquid gets easily collected and separated by weight. Lighter and medium weight liquids don't need as much processing before they're ready to be used in cars and trucks. Heavier liquids, on the other hand, take longer to process. To make heavy oil as useful as possible, there's a process called cracking. Basically, heavy oil has long strings of carbon and hydrogen molecules. By using a catalyst, these molecules can be broken or cracked into smaller chains. This makes the heavier liquid lighter and more valuable. One of the products that gets separated in this distilling product is a liquid that's called naphtha. The number of carbon atoms in naphtha is around the same as in gasoline. The difference is that the structure is more complex. Because of this reforming, the naphtha molecule gets rearranged and turned into a usable gasoline-like molecule. Next up, there's the blending process. What this means is mixing a bunch of different refinery products to create finished gasoline. Another process is called treating. Treating is important to produce cleaner gasoline and protect our health and environment. The thing about gasoline molecules is that they contain impurities like sulfur. But once the molecules are heated and come in contact with a special catalyst, chemical reaction occurs. This reaction removes and strips away the sulfur. These sulfur compounds are then used as fertilizer and in pharmaceuticals. But now you tell me, what's the price of gas in your city? And how high do you think prices will get this year? Please share by commenting below. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for your support.